important and informational webinar on taxes and the Affordable Care Act. Today we will be joined by Judy Solomon from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities and Amy Killalay from the National Association for State and Territorial, Territorial Aid Directors. Before we, be, before we begin, we have a few housekeeping items to go over. All participants are in listen-only mode, but we encourage you to use the question feature on the right-hand side of your screen to ask questions throughout the webinar. We will answer questions at the end of the presentation. If you are unable to hear the audio, you can dial in using the telephone number and access code provided on the audio control tab on your computer. We also encourage you to download the slides after today's webinar. They will be available both in a follow-up email and on HIVHealthReform.org. You can also follow us and live tweet during the webinar using the hashtag taxes, tax credits, and HIV. We encourage all participants to visit our website, HIVHealthReform.org, to find the most important up-to-date information on the Affordable Care Act. You can read our blog, access our email newsletters, and download materials from previous webinars. Lastly, we encourage you to use the Speak Up feature on this website to report problems you or a client may have experienced while enrolling in a health care plan, accessing a health network, or pay for medication. Through Speak Up, we are able to identify patterns of discrimination emerging that need to be addressed, educate state and federal officials about what's happening on the ground, advocate for change, and report back to the community. Now to the webinar. First up, we have Judy Solomon from the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, who will provide a general overview of taxes and how the Affordable Care Act impacts the tax filing process. Judy? Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I take the first slide, which is just really the topics that I'm going to be covering. Um, next one. <laughs> Okay, well, we skipped the, the outline of the topics, but that's okay. So what I'm going to, this is really the gist right here of what I'm going to, what I'm going to be talking about. It's, um, this really, what you're going to get today is, is a very, very short version of about five webinars that we uh, did for voluntary tax preparation community, the VITA, and others that work to help people through the tax process. And what I really just want to be able to do here is um, show you the, the really four places that the ACA, the Affordable Care Act, affects the tax return. And, and the first one is the one that affects everybody, and that is the um, requirement to have health insurance coverage that began last January 2014. Um, and that is, of course, um, enforced for people who don't have an exemption by a penalty. So the first step that is going to happen is that um, it's pretty simple. It's basically saying whether or not you or and all the people on your return had coverage for the full year. And that is on line 61 of the 1040 form. If everyone on the return had coverage every month of the year, they basically will check the box. And, and for most people, they'll be done. Now, people who got um, health coverage through a marketplace and received advanced premium tax credits or maybe they didn't receive it in advance and want to claim it, they actually will have uh, to go to what's here as step four. But for most people, you know, if you have employer coverage for the whole year, you're going to be checking that box and you're done. Um, so that's really step one. And we're going to go through each of these in, in a little bit of detail, not a, a great deal. For people who don't have coverage for some or all of months in the year, what the next step that a tax preparer is going to take is to determine whether or not they um, qualify for an exemption, and, and which would avoid having to pay a penalty. So that's step two. Uh, if no coverage and no exemption, uh, step three is computing the penalty. And as I said, step four is for the people who were actually in a marketplace plan and want to claim a premium tax credit. So let's start with step one, which is really the, the sort of easiest. If we go to the next slide, um, this is just an overview of, of what qualifies as minimum essential coverage, which is the the term of art uh, for coverage that meets the individual responsibility requirement or the individual mandate. Um, 
most forms of health coverage are considered minimum essential coverage, and that's on the left side. Um, but on the right side, you can see that there are some types of coverage that aren't, uh, you know, someone might have coverage, but it's not considered minimum essential coverage. The um, items that are in red are uh, a lot of the, the sort of special Medicaid programs, um, and they've been deemed not to be minimum essential coverage. However, for 2014, people who were enrolled in any of those programs, as well as these um, particular forms of the TRICARE government program, will be considered um, as exempt from the penalty. Um, we will probably see soon some additional activity in the area of medically needy coverage under Medicaid and 1115 demonstrations where um, HHS will deem some forms in some states that this is also minimum essential coverage. But for now, I think for this year, um, nobody in these, in these coverages um, will have to pay a penalty. I did want to say sort of one thing um, that's coming up as an area of confusion. I'm sure many of you know that um, for the most part, if you have employer-sponsored coverage, you can't get premium tax credits. However, if the coverage is not affordable, or doesn't meet a minimum value test, which measures the adequacy of the coverage, people can qualify for premium tax credits. What we've seen is some confusion about people who are enrolled in coverage um, and have employer coverage and have something from their employer saying that the coverage doesn't meet the minimum value standard. Um, that doesn't matter. If you enrolled in the coverage, it's going to be considered to be minimum essential coverage. Whether it meets minimum value is only relevant to whether or not you can get a premium tax credit. So that's something we've seen um, with some, some confusion where people think they don't have minimum essential coverage. Um, but as you can see, any, pretty much any employer coverage is um, considered minimum of value. So let's go to step two, um, which is on the next slide, and that's the exemption. And, and what you have here is really a whole webinar in and of itself, um, determining whether an exemption is available. There are many different amendment, uh, exemptions. Some can only be obtained from the marketplace, some can only be claimed on the tax return, and some you can get from both places. In general, the IRS exemptions are easier to obtain. So this is a flowchart that, that we prepared uh, for the, the tax repairs we're working with. Um, the first question would be whether the taxpayer has an exemption in hand. And that means that they applied to the marketplace and they got an exemption and they get this six or seven digit number that they can put on their tax return. You won't see too many of these except in one circumstance, and that's in states that haven't expanded Medicaid. People who applied for coverage at the marketplace and had um, income below the poverty line and were in what we call the Medicaid coverage gap, meaning they, um, they can't get premium credits because their income's below the poverty line and, and they don't qualify for Medicaid because their state hasn't expanded. Um, a, uh, the marketplace, the federal marketplace, which is where all these states are actually, um, is sent, it, sent people certificate numbers as part of their eligibility determination process, basically saying here's, here's an exemption. So those people might come in with a number, but for the most part, you'll probably see people who have don't have an exemption from the marketplace. So what you're going to want to do then is look and see whether they're eligible for any of the IRS exemptions. Uh, the next one that we have here is the income below the filing threshold. So that's people who are pretty low income. They often are filing taxes to claim an earned income tax credit or to get back withholding. Um, and they can qualify for a, a exemption for everybody on the return for the entire year. So that would be the next one you would want to look at. After that, you see um, a list um, on the left, all um, exemptions that last 
for the whole year, and on the right, exemptions that last for part of the year that can be claimed on the tax return. And, and we don't have time to go through all of them. But that would be your, the next step to see if any of these are available. And finally, the last thing to do would be to see whether um, exemptions that can be rece received at the marketplace, mostly on the basis of hardships, um, and there's a long list of hardships, being evicted, um, illnesses, and so on. These require a paper application to the marketplace. So that's why we sort of think it's your last resort. If someone um, hasn't done that yet, they can still apply for these. And what they would do is apply, and on their tax return, they would write um, where the certificate number is supposed to go, they would write pending. Um, and if they didn't get it, uh, they would probably have to go back and amend their return. So that's step two. Step three, um, next slide, is for the people who end up not having coverage and not being exempt. And there the penalty is going to have to be calculated. Um, there's two different ways that the, the penalty is calculated. The first way um, is that it it is based on a percentage of income above the filing threshold. The other way is a flat amount. And you see the figures here. And the penalty is the higher of the two. So um, last year, I think we heard a lot of, you know, the penalty is only $95, not a big deal. Well, that was kind of wrong for a lot of people because it's not $95. It's either the greater of 95 or 1% of income above the top tax filing threshold. And I have two examples here, um, starting on the next slide, to show you how um, that plays out. And the first is a um, single young man, John. Um, his income is $17,000 a year. Um, the tax filing threshold for a single person, you see it there, is $10,150. So you subtract that from his income and multiply what's left by 1%, and you get 6850 which is less than 95 So John actually would have that $95 penalty. Let's go to the next example, which is a family. Um, their income is $39,500. Um, there's four of them. The tax filing threshold that applies to this family is, is higher. When you take it, when you subtract it from their income, you get um, 19200 and multiply that by 1%, 192 um, And again, for them, the flat amount, which is um, you know, for each adult and two, ch two children, is, um, is higher. Uh, so they would pay that. But you could see, you know, when you get into higher incomes, people would have to pay those larger 1% amounts. Now, this is the, the year that it's pretty low. If you go to the next slide, you'll see that um, in future years, it's, it's going up. Um, next, this year for 2015, and you know, when you're talking to people, you, you can say, you know, even though it was pretty low this year, you um, have a higher exposure next year in 2015. And then in 2016, it goes up even higher um, to, um, you know, 6.95 per adult, or 2.5 percent of income above the threshold, and and I won't go through all those numbers again. I'm I'm just conscious of the time, so we're gonna keep with and through. So that's the penalty. Now there, here's where I want to spend a little more time on step four because these are the people who were enrolled in marketplace coverage. We can go to the next slide. Um, they were enrolled in marketplace coverage and, and probably, in most cases, got the advance payment of the premium tax credits. And now they have to figure out what their final credit amount is. Keep in mind that everything that happened at the marketplace in terms of the amount of the credit was preliminary. It was based on an estimate of income, an estimate of who you expected to be on your tax return. and when you actually file your taxes, that's when those things are really known for sure. And there's the final calculation and a reconciliation of that final credit amount against what people got in advance. 
So let's just review and remember who can get a premium credit. Um, first of all, you have to be enrolled in a marketplace plan. If you buy a, a, a plan outside of the marketplace, um, you could be, you know, have income at the right level and not have any other coverage, but you're not going to be able to get the credit. So that's sort of number one. Number two is that income has to be between 100 and 400 percent of the poverty line. And you can see the, the, what that plays out with in dollars on the slide. But there is a very important exception, and that is for lawfully present immigrants, um, people who are here, um, they're not citizens, but they're in the country legally. Uh, if they have income below the poverty line and they're not eligible for Medicaid because of their immigration status, Medicaid has um, a lot of rules about, you know, which legal immigrants can be eligible. For example, um, in most cases, um, legal permanent residents are ineligible for Medicaid their first five years in the country. And there's a lot of different um, groups that um, really will never meet the Medicaid requirements, particularly people who are here on non-immigrant visas, um, farm workers, and, and so on. And, you know, pretty much everyone is subject um, to the mandate. So um, the, the basic structure of the Affordable Care Act is that if we're going to make um, lawful people lawfully residing in the U.S. subject to the mandate and potentially the penalty, then we have to give them a pathway to coverage. And for immigrants, um, we had to extend that below the poverty line because in so many cases they're not going to qualify for Medicaid. So that's an important exception. Um, the third thing is that you have to have an eligible filing and dependent status. And here this is mostly affects people who are married filing separately. Um, you can't claim the credit if you're married filing separately, with two exceptions, um, one for abandoned um, and abused spouses, um, and, and the other for uh, spouses who are uh, survivors of domestic violence. Now, um, there, there is a filing status, and there's a lot of confusion about this. Um, some people who are married can file their taxes as head of household because they have a dependent that they're caring for in their house. Um, they are eligible for premium tax credits, but you know it's, it's sort of they have to say they're single. It's the only way they can get through the application, so that's really important. But you know, someone who um, you know splits up um, and doesn't meet these exceptions for being abandoned or a uh, survivor of domestic violence, they're not going to be able to get the credit. And you can't be a dependent. Now, you, you can get it as a dependent, but you have to, it has to be claimed by the person who claims you. So a dependent can't file um, his or her own return and, and claim the premium tax credit. And then you have to be ineligible for other minimum essential coverage. So you can't qualify for Medicaid or Medicare or um, employer coverage. So let's go on to how this um, plays out. So once somebody gets an advance payment of the premium tax credit, they have to file their taxes. Even if they never filed a tax return before because their income was below the filing threshold, they have to file a return. Um, if they didn't claim the credit but they were eligible, they can claim it on their return. Um, and if they got too much, um, they have to pay it back. But there's cash. And here are the caps. So if income's below the poverty line, 200% of the poverty line, single individuals, and here it's just people who are single. It's not head of household. It's single individuals um, won't have to pay back more than 300. And you can see um, what it is for other taxpayers who are not single and, and higher income levels. Once you go above the 400% of the poverty line, you have to pay it all back because at that point you're deemed not to have been eligible at all. So you've got to be careful if you're if you're at that sort of margin, you might want to not take it in advance and, and wait to see what happens when you file your taxes. Next slide. 
So this is just a reminder of how the premium tax credit is calculated because, you know, the marketplace calculated the advance credit and it was done by computer and people, you know, don't really know, but now they come to the tax return and they have to somehow um, get a final credit calculated. So the, the premium tax credit is the difference between a benchmark plan, which is the second lowest cost silver plan available to each person in the household, and you basically take each person and add them together, and then minus the expected contribution from the family, and that is tied to income. It's a sliding scale and varies from 2% um, to 9.5% of income, and that's what's subtracted from the cost of the benchmark plan to get the premium credit. Now, next slide. How does someone know uh, what to put on their tax return? Um, well, they are going to get information from the marketplace to give them all the information they need um, to fill out their tax return. Now, this, this form 1095A, people should have received it already. Um, it should be in people's marketplace accounts. Um, it, um, it can be incorrect. I mean, you may look at it, someone may look at it. If it is, it's important to know that the IRS has nothing to do with what the information is and the marketplace is, is where a form has to be corrected. And you see that box up on the top. Um, if it's checked, it would be a form that's corrected. And it has all the information um, that's needed to fill out the, re the form, but you don't actually file this form. Next slide. So we just sort of created a, a dummy form for John um, and assumed that this is his 1095A and he started getting premium credits in April. And you know we didn't show you every month, but we're assuming that it stayed the same. His monthly premium, and this is the amount of the premium for the plan he selected. Um, the monthly premium for the second lowest cost silver plan, which is the benchmark, um, was 211. You see this, and John got $75. So how is he going to fill out his tax return? Next slide. Next slide. So this is what the form looks like. It's form 8962. There's actually, I didn't mention, there's an 8965, which is the exemption uh, form. This is 8962. And it basically takes you through a premium tax credit calculation. So you see um, it has how many people are in John's household, what was his income, his modified adjusted gross income. We're not going to go into what that is because we don't have time. But um, you see here it's $23,340. Um, and then um, we have to figure out to see what his contribution is, what his um, poverty level income is. So that's what's computed on 4 and 5. You take the poverty level for 1, divide that into his income, and we now know that John is at 203% of the poverty line. In the instructions to 8962 as a table, once you get the poverty level income, you look at that and you see what your applicable figure is. This is the figure that you'll now use to multiply times income to get the expected contribution that can be subtracted from the benchmark. So that's what's going on here. Next slide. So this is the part of the form where you're kind of importing the information from the 1095 to get to what the actual premium tax credit was. And for John, from April to the end of the year, his final credit was $774. Um, from the 1095, you know that he received 675 and he got $99 less than he was entitled to. So he now has a refund of $99. If um, the number if the number on line 25 is bigger than 24, he actually would have an overpayment and he would owe money back um, to the IRS and that would sort of be factored into his overall tax computation of withholding and so on. Next slide. So that was it on the taxes. The one thing um, that you know 
we we talked when we were prepping this is um, one sort of special issue. This is sort of um, switching gears a little bit. Is just to kind of alert you all on special attention to people who and and it's probably happening a lot this year as people um, renew their coverage who are transitioning uh, from the marketplace to Medicaid. In some cases, this is because um, income dropped. In other cases, um, as in a lot of people in Pennsylvania, it's because the state expanded Medicaid. Um, so we had a lot of people who were in the marketplace um, over 100%, 100 to 138, um, who are now eligible for Medicaid. It's very, very tricky. Um, if um, and and really the the what we're really trying to think about is how do you do it in a way that you don't have a gap in coverage? Obviously, you don't want people to uh, turn off their marketplace coverage too soon before they know they're going to get Medicaid. But at the same time, you don't want them to wait too long and have double coverage, because double coverage um, can result next year in the potential for having to pay back amounts, because remember, you're not supposed to get premium tax credits if you um, were eligible for Medicaid. Um, here, there's a link there to instructions on the website, but you know, I think even there, I would say it's a little unsatisfactory, because People are being encouraged to um, terminate their Medicaid, terminate their uh, health plans, their marketplace plans, as soon as they get a notice saying that your case is being sent over to Medicaid. And I'm sure, as many of you know, there can be delays. So I think this is um, the notices that individuals are getting are not that clear in sort of telling them what they should do. So if you're working with people in this situation, I think what you need to tell them is um, it's really important as soon as they know they've been determined eligible for Medicaid, um, then to turn off their, um, to, to contact uh, the marketplace and, and basically close out of qualified health plan and, and premium tax credits. Um, as soon as Medicaid is going to be effective. So there's no gap and no overlap. And it's tricky. Um, so anyway, I'm more than happy uh, to take questions on that on individual cases. We can, we can handle those it's at the end of the presentation. You'll see some, some resources. The next thing on the next slide is um, just a little information on um, free in-person tax assistance that's available. Um, it both through the VITA program, Voluntary Income Tax Assistance Program, as well as Tax Counseling for the Elderly. Um, mostly of those are operated by the ARP. And you can see um, just some of the, the availability. If you go to the next slide, there's some links here where you can look up the sites um, in, in someone's area to find out you know, what's available when they're open and all of that. I've also included um, HHS resources on, on tax and the ACA, IRS resources, um, and the resources that we have on our website for both health assisters and tax preparers. And um, yesterday, um, I, after I had sent these slides in, we released um, a new guide uh, on the ACA for tax preparers. It's a companion, actually, to a guide for health assisters, which is tax rules for health assisters. This one's um, the health rules for tax preparers. So uh, both of those are on the website, and, and you might find them helpful. They have a lot of the information that I went through today in a, in a little bit of a slower format. So I think the only thing left, the next slide, is, is contact information um, for me. Um, for questions that are sort of if you're working on something and you have a question, the best thing to do is send it to that Beyond the Basics web, um, email address um, because that can then be sort of sent to the, you know, we have about 10 people on our team and we all have different expertise and, and it'll get to the right person that way. Um, although, feel free to contact me directly. Um, and there is how you can tweet me, Twitter, <laughs> follow me, or whatever. 
still don't have all the lingo down. So I thank you, and I guess I'm turning it to Amy. Is that is that right, Molly? Um, I'll actually do a quick um, interjection here. Thank you so much, Judy. Um, that was really great information. Um, and before we move on to Amy, I just want to remind everyone to submit questions using the question tools on the right side of your screen. So yes, next we will turn it over to Amy Killale with the National Association of State and Territorial AIDS Directors. And Amy will be um, providing us with information about the ACA ADAP coordination and the premium repayment process. Great. Thank you, Molly, and thank you, Judy. Um, it's, it's great to, to be talking to you about uh, all things taxes and the sort of intersection of all the stuff that Judy just talked about in terms of the, the premium tax credit reconciliation and aid drug assistance program and other Ryan White uh, insurance purchasing programs. Next slide. So, you know, b before I get into to some of the, the um, basics of, of where the, the intersection between ADAP and Ryan White Insurance Purchasing and, and the tax filing requirements through ACA um, really is, I, I think it's important to sort of step back and, and think about why this is important. And we know, um, you know, looking at what the, the ACA transition looked like uh, over, over year one and year two, that um, in the vast majority of states, AIDS drug assistance programs and other Ryan White uh, grantees are uh, helping clients with that remaining premium obligation. So even, even after the federal premium tax credit is taken into account, that remaining individual obligation um, left over, ADAP is really helping clients to, to meet that. Um, so because we've, we've entered in a, a third party to the, um, the, the scenario, a third party who's paying a piece of the premium, we have to think about you know, how ADAP interacts with this system. It's not as simple as uh, the, the interaction of, of the taxpayer or the client with the IRS. We've got to kind of figure out uh, where ADAP fits in. So next slide. So there's a lot on this slide. Um, and so please do not read all, all of the small text, because um, I'm going to go through it uh, sort of step by step. But I, I did want to sort of visually show that um, you know, ADAP and, and Ryan White's um, insurance purchasing programs have a role sort of every every step of the way along the, the kind of life cycle of, of uh, premium tax credits that at application uh, throughout the year in terms of, of the, the payment process of, of that premium obligation to um, a person's plan and then at the end of the year which is what we're going to focus on in terms of, of the tax filing requirements and reconciliation of the advanced premium tax credits in particular. Um, and and uh, the one thing that I want to note and I'll probably reiterate this throughout uh, my presentation is that it's really, really important for everybody to check with your own state ADAP and Ryan White program about your own internal state policies. Every ADAP is a little bit different. Every ADAP is going to do things a little bit differently and have uh, different policies and forms and requirements for, for ADAP insurance purchasing. Um, so it's really important to be checking in with your ADAP about what ADAP is doing with regard to reconciliation um, and, and what sorts of information ADAP is putting out to clients and case managers alike. Um, I, I'll talk sort of in generalities, but, um, but that's a, a really important sort of take-home first step for, for everybody on the call. Next slide. So I'm going to go through kind of piece by piece of that, that sort of life cycle um, and starting, you know, with the beginning. Where does ADAP really interact at the application period? And I think, you know, the, the reason for, for not just running right to the sort of end story of, of what happens at tax time is that um, what, what makes this process as simple as possible is really not to have a difference in the amount that you were supposed to get in premium tax credits and the amount you actually got. Um, it's sort of eliminating reconciliation altogether. And so the very first way um, that, that that happens and how ADAP has been involved is um, uh, uh, to, to have clear parameters in terms of uh, what plans ADAP is, is purchasing and um, requirements for, for clients who are going to get ADAP uh, help in meeting that remaining premium obligation. So this is a screenshot. Um, this is one example, though um, I think this policy is in place in, in a lot of other states. It's from the Virginia AIDS Drug Assistance Program. Um, and this is up on, on the Virginia ADAP website um, and really laying out the, the policies of, of, of who is eligible um, and, and uh, what the requirements are to get ADAP premium assistance um, uh, to, for help paying for qualified health fund premiums. Um, so I, I want to point out a couple of things. Um, you know, first and foremost, and, and relating to the reconciliation process in particular, uh, there is a requirement um, for, for Virginia ADAP, and I would say that the, um, 
the vast majority, if not all, ADAP insurance purchasing programs require any client who's going to get ADAP help with their premiums to take the full amount of the premium tax credit in advance. So as you remember from sort of the, the premium tax credits 101, um, you know, you've got a choice. When, when somebody enrolls in coverage, they can opt to take the, the premium tax credit in advance so that it starts immediately when they enroll, um, gets paid to, to their, their, their plan starting immediately, or they can take it as a tax refund. So, you know, the, the client, the taxpayer, is sort of footing the bill for his or her premiums throughout the year, and then come tax time, we'll get that, that federal premium tax credit in the form of a refund. Well, as we'll discuss later, getting it in the form of a refund when you're having ADAP uh, help with the remaining premium uh, amount that, that the client or, or person owes um, is really, really complicated. So ADAPs are right up front at the application process requiring clients to take the full amount uh, of the premium uh, tax credit in advance. Um, in addition, you know, and this, this is uh, common uh, among states, uh, states who are helping with, with the, the premium payments is that um, uh, ADEPs are, are, are requiring clients to, to enroll in certain plans that have an adequate formulary and that meet cost effectiveness requirements for, for ADAP. So that's another thing to look at when you look at uh, your state's ADAP policies with regard to, to premium assistance. Um, and then, and this is something that I think um, comes up at application, and we'll also talk again when we talk about, about what happens at, at tax time, but um, more and more uh, age drug assistance programs are moving to align their income criteria. So right, ADAP um, has a, an income threshold that varies by state to be eligible for, for ADAP assistance. Um, you have to have a certain income. So more and more ADAPs are aligning what types of income they look like with the, the way that the federal government uh, calculates income eligibility for the premium tax credits and cost sharing reductions. And that's modified adjusted gross income. And I know that, that Center on Budget has done a lot of great uh, webinars and, and put out other resources on that. I'll, I'll sort of um, uh, direct folks to those other resources to explain in depth what, what MAGI is, but that's just another thing to note. You know, ADAPs are really trying to make this process as seamless as possible for clients, and one way to do that is to try to align the, the income criteria. So next slide. So then, um, you know, the, the sort of next step in our, our life cycle is, you know, what, what happens throughout the year. Um, and throughout the year that, you know, your clients are enrolled in qualified health plans and they've got monthly monthly premium obligations. So, you know, ADAP are, and Ryan White insurance purchasing programs are interacting every step of the way. They're really, um, first and foremost, stepping in to cover that remaining premium obligation left over after the federal premium tax credit. And just to, to sort of put a finer point in that and to, uh, uh, bring that point out in an example. If you look at, at the two boxes there, um, you've got two income examples of, of Mike and Mary, um, where uh, uh, you, we've sort of calculated out what the federal premium tax credit amount would be um, and, and what the individual, the minimum contribution left over for that client to pay would be. So, you know, it, it, it's sliding scale. It's going to go up. That individual contribution will go up depending on, on your income. Um, so for some, it, it's a, a fairly significant amount, even with a federal premium tax credit. Um, and that's where ADAP and Ryan White interns purchasing programs have really been able to step in and, and been that difference of being able to, to afford uh, a monthly premium and, and staying uh, retained in, in insurance coverage uh, and not. Um, so, so, you know, that's, that's been a, a, a sort of constant. And, and again, this is another way um, that, that different programs uh, sort of do the payments differently, and I won't get into too many details about that, um, uh, but, uh, except to say, you know, check with your ADAP in terms of what sorts of, of information monthly are required from clients who are on the program in terms of um, uh, clients, you know, reporting the, um, any, any correspondence they get from their plan, um, whether ADAPs are able to, to pay, you know, uh, premium amounts in advance or whether they're making payments month by month. Um, that, that varies state by state. Um, and the other thing that, that ADAPs and Ryan White insurance purchasing programs are doing um, is really checking in with clients about the importance of, of reporting income changes to the marketplace during the year. Um, and this is being done, you know, at various points, just through, through sort of regular ADAP communication, through case manager communication, um, at the ADAP six-month recertification uh, uh, process, um, really any and all sort of opportunities. Um, because as I said, like the, the the best way to deal with, with reconciliation is not to have an amount that you need to reconcile. Um, so that's been a really big piece of, 
of the education component. Next slide. So finally, we, we get to, to tax time, um, and, and uh, you know, we're, we're sort of just now getting to how ADAP uh, and Ryan White insurance purchasing programs uh, really interact with the federal tax filing requirements through ACA and, and reconciliation in particular. So I think, you know, a lot of this is, is we are, are building the policies and trying to figure out um, as, as we, we wend our way through through kind of new and, and uncharted territory. Um, you know, it, it, the, the first thing that I, that I think is something to just be aware of is that, um, you know, ADAP and Ryan White program, um, insurance purchasing programs, have started the, the federal tax filing uh, requirement for anyone who got uh, advanced premium tax credit, starting those education efforts around the need to file federal taxes early. So at the point of enrollment uh, in, in this open enrollment period and last year's open enrollment period and throughout, to really make sure that clients understand, if you receive the premium tax credit, you got to file federal taxes, even if that's something that, that you haven't done in the past. Um, so there, there's really been an, an education effort there, um, and and I think you know that that's that's a ramp up to at tax time. If ADAP was paying that re remaining premium amount, their remaining um, individual contribution amount left over after the, the federal premium tax credit. Um, then, then ADAP is going to require that tax information uh, to be submitted to ADAP so that ADAP, and, and I'll explain sort of a little bit um, in more detail why that is, but that's just an important piece to keep in mind that ADAP is going to need that information in order to, to do its own sort of reconciling of, of um, the, the amount um, that ADAP paid for the individual throughout the year, the amount that individual was getting in federal premium tax credit, and then overall annual income. Um, so that's just important to, to remember. Um, so next slide. So, and I, I also want to um, just kind of note the, the HRSA HIV AIDS Bureau uh, policies on reconciliation. And, you know, this is, this is going to be a little bit um, incomplete because we're still waiting for, for some really important guidance from, from HRSA on this. But, but here's what we know, and, and I want to talk a little bit about, about where programs are sort of going with this, this information. Um, so, you know, at this point, I think we are all very familiar with the phrase vigorously pursue. Um, and I think we're, we're still kind of kind of learning what, what it means in, in practice. Um, so, you know, we, we've seen in, in HRSA um, policy notices that um, a reiteration that the Ryan White program is payer of last resort. Grantees must vigorously pursue client eligibility for public and private insurance. And, and, and that makes sense, right? I mean, we want to make sure that, that folks get onto insur comprehensive insurance coverage if they are eligible. And we want to preserve, you know, scarce and constrained federal resources. On the flip side of that, what HRSA has also um, acknowledged and recognized, which I think also makes a lot of sense, is that the Ryan White program is a public health program and a safety net program, and and folks may not be disenrolled uh, for failure to enroll in in coverage. So that's that's the vigorously pursue of, of enrollment. We also see vigorously pursue come up um, when we talk about about reconciliation. Um, HRSA has said that, that uh, grant Ryan White grantees um, also have to vigorously pursue any excess premium tax credit that, um, that a client receives from the IRS uh, when he or she submits their, their tax return. So if um, at tax time a person's income, income ends up being lower than the income used to calculate the advanced premium tax credit. So they didn't get the right amount throughout the year. Um, they, they, uh, uh, at tax time, um, uh, uh, they file their, their federal taxes, they file all those forms, um, and in fact they are, um, uh, they are owed a refund by the IRS. Um, you know, what HRSA is saying here is that that refund doesn't actually, it, it goes to the taxpayer, but it's not owed to the taxpayer. ADAP, or the Ryan White grantee, was the one who was actually paying that individual's uh, remaining premium obligation. So any refund would, would be owed at the end of the day to ADAP, but that's not how the IRS works, right? IRS is not going to uh, cut a slice of the refund check to, to ADAP. They're going to they're gonna send that to the taxpayer. And what complicates that is that, you know, the, the, the IRS and how you file your taxes is that how that works is that all of your tax liabilities are calculated, all of your refunds are calculated, and they're all calculated together. There's not a separate check that comes to an individual just for their premium tax credit refund. Um, so that complicates uh, this whole idea that, that grantees have to vigorously pursue that refund. And, and programs know that, that it's complicated. So, you know, we're starting to see programs, um, aid drug assistance programs and insurance purchasing programs, 
um, come up with policies, start reaching out to clients about, about how this will work. Um, and, 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 you know, I think we'll continue to see a lot of education and policies around this. And I think year one is definitely going to be a learning year for, for all concerned on this. Um, so, you know, I, I want to also mention the sort of the, the flip side. Um, if at tax time a person's income ends up being higher than the income used to calculate the advanced premium tax credit, so you know, that person was getting uh, uh, too much in, in advanced premium tax credit and they owe money to the IRS at the end of the year, even though, you know, Judy explained what the caps on what you owe back, you still owe something back to the IRS. Um, HRSA has, has uh, uh, called for comment and is contemplating releasing guidance that would allow grantees to pay that amount owed by that client, that individual, to the IRS, which makes sense because ADAP or Ryan White grantee would have been paying that all along had the, the income been, um, been reported um, accurately um, and, and uh, the premium tax credits received throughout the year had been accurate. Um, but, you know, that's obviously complicated for the exactly the same reasons I just talked about in terms of how the IRS does taxes. So that's a, a, a um, stay tuned. Um, and I know that that's a lot and it's all very complicated, so I really need to stress that this year is going to be sort of a learning year and, and, um, and at the end of the day, you know, Ryan White ADAP is a safety net public health program and I think that's really important to keep in mind. So next slide. So what, what does this mean? What does this sort of translate into in terms of the types of policies that we're seeing? Well, you know, as I said, we're, we're all at this point real familiar with, um, with the concept of, of vigorously pursue um, and, and what uh, uh, grantees have, how they've sort of given meaning to, to what is at its heart a very vague uh, phrase and concept. Um, and, you know, we've seen programs really implement um, really strong uh, eligibility screening policies. Um, they're documenting every step of the way, client contact, to make sure folks are, are getting enrolled in, in uh, public and private insurance coverage. Um, uh, and again, like that, the policy that we saw in Virginia that we've seen in, in many, many places is requiring clients to accept that full amount of the premium tax credit in advance, um, acknowledging up front in an attestation or other way uh, the need to report changes in income to the marketplace. Um, and, and I think that the point that, that you don't see here as a policy, but I think is probably the most important piece of the puzzle is that age drug assistance programs and Ryan White insurance purchasing programs are really um, stressing education, are um, throughout have really been trying to direct folks to some of the tax prep resources that, that Judy mentioned, um, have been stressing the importance of reporting changes in income throughout the year uh, to avoid any, any overpayment or underpayment scenario to deal with at, at tax time. Um, so really trying to, to sort of marshal efforts at the front end um, uh, uh, as opposed to try to, to cobble things together at tax time or after the fact, which, you know, as the reasons I just went through, is complicated. Um, so, so that, that, and I think that will continue. We're sort of in the midst of tax season, and I think we're going to continue to see a lot of education um, efforts going forward. So next slide. So, you know, I, I, I know we wanted to leave um, plenty of time for questions, and I'm, I'm sure there are a lot because there are a lot of moving pieces to this, but I did just want to note um, uh, some of the, the resources available um, in addition to the great ones that, that Judy referenced. Um, I would just urge folks to check out the, the HRSA HAB page up there on um, the Affordable Care Act um, and Ryan White uh, uh, and, and what that means. All of the policy notices that I mentioned are on that page. But there's also some really good um, new information, and, and um, I believe there's a webinar material um, up from a fairly recent webinar that, um, that HRSA did with the IRS on walking through some of the, the grantee uh, implications for, for um, tax filing and for reconciliation in particular. So I would, I would um, urge folks to look there and keep an eye there also for updated guidance on uh, uh, that piece that still remains a question on whether grantees will be able to pay um, any amounts owed because of premium tax credit to the IRS on behalf of clients. So I'm going to uh, turn it back to, um, to Molly for our, our Q&A portion. Great. Thanks, Amy. Um, so we will move into questions. Um, and we will note that uh, taxes are confusing. And now with the Affordable Care Act sort of getting mixed into taxes, it sort of complicates things a bit more. So some of the questions are, um, really great um, and, and somewhat specific and maybe complicated. 
So I am going to throw them out there. If we are not able to um, answer them here on the phone call um, or on the webinar, we will get in touch with you afterwards and make sure we, uh, we get your questions answered. So the first one um, is uh, from someone here. Can you speak to the role of navigators or enrollment assisters in the tax prep and filing process? Should they assist consumers with this? So this is Judy. I, I would say um, the assistance really should be with uh, maybe helping connect them to um, someone in, in the VITA or the, the other tax prep programs uh, because, you know, it's obviously beyond the, the tax piece of this. There's, there's a lot of other implications of how you fill out your taxes. So I think it would be better to um, have a referral and, and what we've been really encouraging and I hope this sort of grows up over time are having some real cross referral because at the same time you know the the health assisters might need to refer to tax preparers when um, the tax return is done there really um, in many cases should be a referral back to an assister and you know a number of different situations obviously you know um, open enrollments almost over but for early filers um, we're really hoping for people who end up with a penalty or even an exemption um, because they may not have an exemption next year that uh, they're being referred back to an assister to um, uh, file and even you know we're saying even do that afterwards because Medicaid is open all year and you know there are special enrollment periods so I think we really need these sort of cross referral um, relationships uh, so that you know people can get the full range of expert assistance uh, we're asking people you know to do an awful lot of sisters right if they have to know tax health and so on so I think it's really good to build relationships I know there's a couple places where um, they're doing both because they have the expertise on site and that seems to be going you know really well great thank you um, the next question we have here if a client uh, working full-time enrolls into the marketplace without the advanced premium tax credit and does so instead of their employee or employer offered insurance Will this individual be charged the penalty for utilizing the marketplace coverage instead of the employer offered insurance? No, because they'll have coverage. I mean, the, the thing that's happened to them is they're probably not eligible for a premium tax credit unless they can show that the coverage is um, unaffordable and there's a test for that. It has to cost more than a certain percentage of income, 9.5% for 2014. Um, or it doesn't meet this minimum value test, which is a, a sort of test of, of adequacy of the coverage. Um, but if they, you know, if they decide to forego the employer coverage and enroll in a marketplace plan, that's coverage. That's minimum essential coverage. They're they're good to go. Great, thank you. Um, and Judy, I think this might be a question for you uh, again. So this is in reference to the form uh, 8962 that you spoke to in one of your slides. Um, the question is, if there is an amount entered on form uh, 8962, line 26, which is was in that last slide that you showed us, is that the definitive amount that, enroll, that an enrollee would need to pay back to ADAP um, because he or she overreported uh, the income to the marketplace? Okay, so I'm trying to find the, that slide. I think that is the line actually that they're, go oh, oh, you mean is that the amount that they they got um, underpaid? So that's an underpayment. So that's basically, you know, in the example we had, it was $99. Um, he got um, $675 and he was entitled to $774. So he's entitled to a, a refund of $99. Amy should really answer this, but I think that is the amount that would have to go go back. Yeah, this is Amy. Yeah, I mean exactly. In, in if if the the client or that 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 person was was paying um, that his or her own individual you know premium obligation throughout the year, then then that would be his obligation to pay back to the IRS. Um, or oh, this sorry, is a, this be, is not, yeah, me. this is the refund. Yeah, no, so that, that would be his refund. refund. Exactly. Yeah. So that would be his refund from the IRS. But because you've got ADAP as a third party paying the premiums throughout the year, that refund goes to ADAP because they've been paying the premiums, not the individual, not John. 
Um, so yes, that would be the amount that, that ADAP um, would have to, to vigorously pursue, that would actually be owed to ADAP. Great. Thank you, Amy. Um, next question, if a person had health insurance for 11 of 12 months in 2004, is it correct that they do not owe a tax penalty because you are allowed to go without health insurance for up to three months of each calendar year? If so, how does this person reflect this on their taxes? So, uh, great question. That's one of the exemptions for a short coverage gap, which is a gap less than three months. It has to be less. If it's three months, it doesn't qualify, but one month obviously is less than three months. That's an exemption that can be claimed on the on the return. It would be on this um, form 8965, and it would be code B. And, and when you go to that form, you'll see I think it's part three is for the, the exemptions claimed on the, on the tax return, and they would just write code B. And, Great. and you don't have to have like documentation attached or anything. It's just a matter of putting down the right code. Okay, great. Um, another question about the 8965 form. Um, is there a way that a person can get, <clears throat> excuse me, if a person gets employed during the year, um, can they declare the months that they were not working on their 8965 exemption form? Well, it, it would depend on whether or not during those months they, they qualified for an exemption. So, um, you know, I should have said the penalty is really calculated on a, on a monthly basis. So it would depend. So say, you know, they got the job in, in March, um, then they would have that short coverage gap exemption. Or actually this year, because of some of the challenges in getting uh, people enrolled last year, there's a sort of one-time exemption. Anyone who had coverage by May 1, um, whether it's employer coverage or marketplace or Medicaid or CHIP, if they had coverage by May 1, they get an exemption, and, and that's code G. So it really would depend on when they got um, covered. It, you know, if they were unemployed during the period and they don't qualify for any of these other exemptions, you know, the hardship exemptions, if you looked at the big category of, um, you know, maybe they'd be able to qualify for that. So I think it really is a sort of um, look at what was going on during that month, how long of a period, when did it take place to see if they might qualify for an exemption. And if they didn't, um, they would only have to pay the penalty for the months they didn't have coverage. It would be prorated, um, you know, basically multiplied by 12. Great. Thanks, Judy. Um, how is income <clears throat> defined by the IRS and Ryan White to qualify for uh, benefits? Is income defined as all sources of income, or is income derived only from paychecks, Form 1099? So I can say for the credits, and it, it's something called modified adjusted gross income, which is basically adjusted gross income on the tax return, um, which is, you know, most most income and then with some things deducted. But it's not everything. So it's not child support um, and a number of other stuff. But it's, you know, it's stuff that tax count counts. Plus, um, and then the modified is plus three things. It's um, plus the Social Security benefits. Some For some people, part of Social Security benefits are taxed, but for most people, it's not taxed. So you, you add back the non-taxable portion of Social Security, plus two things that most people don't have, foreign income that was excluded um, from, the, from the tax income, as well as tax-exempt interest. And that's modified adjusted gross income, and that's what's used to determine eligibility. So this is Amy, um, and, and just to follow up on the, the Ryan White income side, um, so I, I, in prior to the ACA, um, you know, d different states sort of differ on how they, uh, what they, they calculate for income eligibility, um, and I would say it, income eligibility, like the actual things that, that um, ADAP or Ryan White is looking at um, in calculating income, and then household sides, uh, which is very much related to, um, to that. Um, and, and what we have seen um, just over the past two years um, is, is many ADAPs move to 
at least partially, um, uh, becoming way more aligned with um, the income criteria of MAGI that, that Judy just described. Um, so that, that if you're, you're eligible for you know, ADAP insurance purchasing um, uh, to get help with your premiums, ADAP is looking at the same things that the marketplace is looking at um, when, when the marketplace calculates whether or not you're eligible for premium tax credit. Um, so we're moving from a, a sort of a state variation uh, uh, income uh, system that, that maybe is a little bit was a little bit simpler um, to uh, much more aligned with uh, uh, federal tax returns and MAGI. Great, thank you. Uh, this question comes from a Ryan White case manager um, who is curious if he or she um, will be notified that a, that a, that a client um, will receive money back that would belong to ADAP, and if ADAP is notified of that, and sort of how those communication channels um, happen, if at all. Sure. Well, so I, I think that these are, these are the, the policies and the, the actual implementation that um, is, is being worked out as we speak. So, you know, I, I think um, ADAP is working out its own sort of communication and um, information requirements with clients who are getting uh, ADAP assistance on that remaining premium piece. So, you know, the, the client is going to file his or her federal taxes, right? And ADAP has nothing to do with that, um, except to, you know, require that federal tax return information be submitted to ADAP so that ADAP can determine if there was a refund that's actually owed to ADAP. So that's, that's kind of point one where, where that sort of information uh, uh, sharing is, is going to come about. Um, and in terms of, of case managers, I mean, that's something that to check in, in with your state in terms of, of um, you know, in terms of, of where case managers fit in and, and how a case manager would get that information. That's going to that's gonna vary by state. Thanks, Amy. Uh, this next qu uh, question comes from someone who works at a volunteer assistance tax assistance site. Um, so this question, are you saying that if we file a return with a pending ECN that the shared responsibility payment will not be charged until the person is denied the hardship exemption and files an amended return. And Judy, I think you said that they, you might be able to take this. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that the answer is yes. I mean, what the you know when you um, when the person has uh, applied, I think there's a recognition that um, you you are allowed to apply for these hardship exemptions actually up to three years um, <laughs> after the year. I'm not sure anybody's going to want to wait that long because. Um, if you go to the, the exemption application, which is a paper process, um, for many of them there are some documentation requirements. So people should really file for those as soon as they can. But yes, you can write pending and then um, it, the IRS will be notified um, on the disposition. So if it's granted, you don't have to do anything. Um, if it was denied, I mean, you could try another hardship exemption, um, or at that point, pay the pen, file an amended return, and pay the penalty. Thanks, Judy. Should clients who are self-employed and have income changes monthly report these changes every single month? Some individuals have had difficulty providing that documentation uh, to the marketplace. So this is one of the hardest things that we have here, you know, and, and why we're seeing, you know, reconciliation being, being, you know, a challenge for some people. This is a very hard thing that we're asking people to do a year in advance, um, estimate what their income is going to be and who's going to be in their household uh, when they file their taxes. I mean, you may have a, an adult child with no income living with you. Um, and then, you know, you don't know what's going to happen in the course of the year. Are they going to uh, get a job and file their own taxes? Um, you know, people may decide to get married during the year. There's a lot of things that go on that are going to affect this. Um, I think in terms of that question, the, the self-employed people, it's really hard. Um, I think they have to kind of do the best job they can of making an estimate based on past experience and what they think is going to happen for that year. And I don't think they need to um, report a change um, month by month. I think, though, they would have to use their judgment. So for example, you know, say you um, 
have, you know, I don't know, you're a, you're an actor, um, and you know, you're kind of struggling along. I say this because my son's an actor, and then all of a sudden you get, you know, a job that's going to, you know, pay a lot more money than you've ever made. That you would want to, um, uh, you know, report. But I think um, sort of a month-by-month -month fluctuation, you know, you worked a little bit more than you expected in one month, there really isn't a need to do that until you really see that, gee, it looks like over the course of this year, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make a lot more than I expected. That's the point you go in. Now, the, the, the formula we have a, in our Beyond the Basics series, um, we did a webinar. The last one we did was sort of, showing kind of how the marketplace adjusts. What's nice is they adjust it um, in a way that really would take you um, to the right place at the end of the year. So major changes definitely should be reported, but you know, making more in one month when you think the next month you may make less is really not something you need to do. It's the big swings, and it's, it's hard. It's hard to make the estimates, um, and I think people are going to feel their way, and they're going to see how this works for them over the year and um, kind of learn from that. Great. Thanks, Judy. Uh, so this question sort of uh, poses a little scenario followed by a question. So let's say that an individual receives uh, Medicaid for themselves and or their children. However, a parent outside of the household claims that child um, as a tax dependent. So when come when filing taxes, um, if the person who is claiming the dependent outside of the house, if that person's income uh, does then, doesn't qualify for Medicaid, what then happens to the children um, and or the other individual who is on Medicaid then? Do they need to transfer to a marketplace plan? No, this is, <laughs> this is where, you know, it starts to get really complicated when we're, you know, we're kind of in Medicaid land, which does it one way, and then the marketplace. Um, Medicaid will determine eligibility based on the parent with whom the child lives. Um, this is an exception. Medicaid has converted to uh, using many of the same rules that are used um, that are based on tax rules, um, but this is one where they've created an exception, and they are the child's eligibility is going to be based on the on the parent with whom the child lives. So in that situation that was just sketched out, um, it would be fine. Um, no, n no problem there. The child has coverage. Um, the, now the, the parent who's claiming the child is, um, as a dependent, is responsible uh, for reporting on the child's coverage, but because the child had Medicaid, um, there's nothing that they would have to worry about or do. They're, they're fine. Thanks, Judy. Um, so if a client files taxes in one state but claims to live in another state, how does this impact their ACA enrollment? In this case, the state the client lives is where that client is enrolled in the Affordable Care Act. So I'm not sure exactly how to answer it other than to say that um, one of the, in order to enroll in a marketplace plan, you have to be the, a resident of the state um, where the marketplace is. So I don't know if that helps. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure I'm exactly following the question. I mean, you could have moved, and then you're just going to kind of, uh, you know, you'll get a 1095 from the marketplace where you were. But the, you know, the general rule is that you should be in the marketplace in the state where you live. Okay, thanks, Judy. And um, we can follow up with that question um, if, if um, the person who answered would like to. Um, next question, if, um, if a client is eligible for Medicaid but wants to apply for p private coverage through the marketplace, will ADAP approve and pay the premium for the marketplace coverage? So this is Amy. Um, 
So the first line of screening is is for for Medicaid eligibility, um, and I know that there's been there's a, a HRSA FAQ that that enters some ambiguity into this, but I, this would be another one that I would check with your your ADAP in terms of screening and eligibility, um, because the, the first line is if if you're eligible for Medicaid, uh, you go to Medicaid, um, and 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 that's a cost effectiveness test for for ADAP as well in terms of of the cost of, of, of Medicaid to ADAP, which is usually nothing, um, versus is purchasing private insurance. Um, so I, 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 and I, and I can take the, the rest of this question because there might be some nuances that I'm missing depending on where you are sort of offline. Um, but um, I would say for the vast majority of states that the screening, the initial screening is always for Medicaid, and that's been in place for, for years and years and years, um, uh, followed by if you're not eligible for Medicaid, you know, what else are you eligible for? Thanks, Amy. Um, next question is about the um, employee coverage. So how are clients being screened for unaffordable employer coverage when applying through the marketplace and also when then filing their taxes? So it really shouldn't happen when they file. Well, I, I, I shouldn't say that. Wait, <laughs> I said it. Let me, let me start. At the marketplace, I mean, this is where it gets super complicated. So at the marketplace, there's a test of um, uh, whether or not the coverage is unaffordable. As I said, in 2014, it was 9.5 percent. Now it's this year, it's 9.56 percent. When you when you apply the test, um, you basically look at what it would cost to enroll the employee, and if it costs less than 9.5 percent uh, to enroll the employee then it's considered affordable, not only for the employee, but for any dependents who are offered coverage um, under the employer plan. So if there's a spouse or a child who has an offer of coverage through the employee plan, even if it costs more than 9.5 percent, it could cost 20 percent to cover the family, that is going to be considered affordable and the, the family is not going to be eligible. That you may have heard call it the um, family glitch. Um, there is a separate test um, when we're looking at an exemption. So when, when someone hasn't had coverage, um, there's an exemption for not having a pathway to affordable coverage. And for people who have an offer of affordable coverage, um, the test is whether or not it's 8% of family income. And for this test, we actually do look, when we're looking at the, um, when we look at the employee, we look at whether employee-only coverage costs more than 8%. But when we look at the family members who could have enrolled in the plan, we actually look at what the cost would have been to cover them. So it's um, really complicated. And you know, if you really wanted to dive into it, you would find out that the definition of income is even different in these two tests. Um, again, I would, uh, you know, for people who really want to dive into this, um, check out Beyond the Basics. There's multiple webinars that covers all of this, um, and you know, you can sign up for future web webinars as well. Thank you. Uh, next question: Can a person elect COBRA to fill a gap in coverage without then disqualifying themselves for a special enrollment period? So this is another one. You can find the, the slides. Um, the general rule for COBRA is that um, it does not, eligibility for COBRA does not bar somebody from premium tax credits. Um, however, if you're enrolled in it, um, and drop it during a period outside of open enrollment, it, you're 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 basically not going to be able to to get in. So it's a it's a timing issue. So you know it's it's you know if someone the the way it would usually play out is you know you leave your job, you lose your job, you have a, a cobra offer. The loss of employer coverage is a special enrollment period. At that point, you can enroll in. Um, you know you can go in two ways. You can enroll in the marketplace. You can enroll in cobra. Um, once you enrolled in COBRA, however, 
you couldn't drop it until the next open enrollment period, at which point you then could drop it and enroll in a marketplace plan. That's a, a, a scenario we cover in, in some of the slides on the, on the website. Thanks, Judy. Um, so what happens to a client who is receiving ADAP premium assistance, um, premium assistance but did not um, opt for the advanced premium tax credit? So how does that work then at the end of the year when they file taxes? Um, and will ADAP um, sort of catch that and ask um, contact then that client uh, for reimbursement? So I mean, the, sh the short answer is yes. I mean, that's, that's like the, the extreme scenario of, of um, not reporting an income change. I mean, that's, you know, you, you've, you've uh, uh, not gotten any advanced premium tax credits, but you've been eligible for premium tax credits. So you wait to get them in the form of a refund well, that's a pretty hefty refund. And meanwhile, if, if ADAP was paying the full freight of, of your premium without, you know, without any federal premium tax credits, that's really ADAP um, uh, who's owed, owed that refund because ADAP is the one who's been paying the premiums all year. Um, so you know, that, that HRSA guidance has been um, pretty clear about that, that um, in that scenario, you know, ADAP needs to make an effort to go after that, that refund and to alert clients of, um, the fact that you know where to look for to get the amount that they're going to get back from the refunds um, on their 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 federal tax forms, um, and to uh, to recoup that from the client. So I think we're still ADAPs are still figuring out what policies are going to make most sense. We still don't know like the numbers that we're talking about in terms of if we're going to see a whole bunch of clients with um, you know really hefty refunds from the IRS or owing a lot of money back to the IRS. We just don't know how this first year is going to play out, but. Um, but you know, HRSA guidance is pretty clear that that ADAPs need to make make an effort to uh, to recoup that. Thanks, Amy. Um, a couple um, social security questions: um, Would someone who receives social security need to file taxes, and would they qualify for a tax credit? So. If Social Security was someone's only income, in general, they wouldn't have a, a requirement to file taxes. However, if they want a premium tax credit, then um, they're going to have to file taxes. Um, that doesn't mean they're going to have to now pay taxes on their Social Security. It just means um, they have to, to do that in order to uh, calculate and, cr and claim the credit. Thank you, Judy. Um, and there is just a clarifying question here um, from a few folks. So accepting the advanced premium tax credit is strongly recommended but not required by HRSA at this time. Is that correct? Or did we misunderstand that? So, so I'll have to go back and look and see what the language is. It's in the, the policy clarification notice um, that HRSA have put out that, that ADAPs, um, and I can't remember if it's required or should do it. It makes good sense. And most ADAPs have taken that to, to require clients to do it um, because it, it, it makes a lot of sense for them to do that. So um, I, I can go back and look and see the, the exact wording, but, um, but at, at, at the very least, it is very strongly uh, encouraged by HAB, and many ADAPs are, are requiring that as part of how they're doing it. Thanks, Amy. Um, so if someone who is, who is working um, and is, but is eligible for Medicaid, and that uh, Medicaid application is pending, which we know can sometimes take 30 to 90 days, will the consumer be penalized um, for the months without coverage while they're waiting for that application to be approved? They shouldn't be because when that is approved, it'll be approved retroactively. So um, assuming that's the case, Medicaid um, coverage is uh, retroactive to usually at least the first month, first day of the month of application, and in some cases it can have even go uh, back up to three months if there were unpaid bills during that period and the person was eligible during that period. Um, there can actually be even even greater uh, amount of un retroactive coverage. So, assuming they get they're found eligible and they, you know, or have eligibility back to the date of application, it shouldn't be a problem for them. Great. Thank you. So the next is, again, another sort of scenario and then question. So 
Um, an employee is offered coverage through their employer, um, and with just that employee, that employee's premium, it is deemed affordable. But then what if um, that employee added a spouse and children, and the premiums in total and some is no longer considered affordable? What happens in that instance? Um, and is it possible that the employer would require the spouse and children to move to the affordable, to something on, on the marketplace? And if so, would they then qualify for a tax credit? So there's a, there's a lot going on in that question. So um, you could see a situation where someone had an affordable offer of coverage and then, you know, which would be based on, you know, let's say we have somebody who's making uh, $30,000 a year. Let, let, let's make it more. Let's, let's say $40,000. Um, and the uh, coverage would cost him um, $6,000 a year to cover him. Now, that's going to be deemed affordable. It's not more than 9% of his income. But now let's say that um, you know this, he he gets married and um, is now going to claim the the children of his his new his wife and she's got you know three kids and she doesn't work. Well, now you have a family of five making forty thousand dollars a year, um, and they're um, you know their their percentage of the the poverty line, their income is is a lot less, um, but it's still really not going to matter because the the test is what it costs to cover him. So you know it really is going to depend on who has an offer of coverage from the employer. Now in this situation. Um, it very well could be that these kids, I mean, often the kids will be eligible for, for CHIP, Children's Health Insurance Program, um, but maybe the employer doesn't offer coverage to the spouse at all. Um, in that case, they're free to go into the marketplace. So it's, it's really complicated. There's a lot of moving parts in all of these questions. The employer, but in answer to the question, the employer doesn't really control kind of who goes where. It's the, you know, it's the individual and the family um, within the constraints of what's available to them. Thanks, Judy. Um, so if a couple's income significantly reduces in 2015 because one of the spouses retired in 2014, what income will be used to calculate the premium tax credit for 2015? Will 2014 taxes be used to calculate this, or will the now significantly reduced income be used? It'll be the 2015 income. Now, this is this is a situation where when they go in, um, so when you apply, you know, you're you're asked to put in, you know, what you expect, and you do that. What they're looking at is the latest, you know, the marketplace is going to. Uh, ping. <laughs> they have a thing called the hub, and, and there's information there that would at this year reflect the 2013 return. Let's assume that was still the same income. So they're going to see that, you know, this is somebody who's saying they're making a lot less um, than they did in 2013. They may be asked to put to give some more information, but the, the, the credit should be calculated based on 2015, and, and they'll be able to show um, you know, what happened, and, and they'll be able to use that 2015 estimate. Thank you. Um, moving on, will the marketplace be looking at um, who opted out of their employer-offered insurance and enrolled into the marketplace, similar to how the marketplace reviewed citizenship and income for marketplace enrollees in 2014? That is a really good question. <laughs> um, we really don't know. Um, there was, you know, there. This has been the the verification of minimum essential coverage has been something that's, you know, really hard. And at, you know, the the rule sort of suggests that there's a back end verification, meaning that you know after the fact they will be doing some verification, um, maybe on a sample. I think this year um, probably was not, you know, this year being 2014, um, 
a lot of that really didn't happen because things were, were just a lot more challenging. But I think going forward, we will see um, more um, real-time verification. But we're also going to see, and this is, this is important, we're also going to see back-end verification by the IRS for 2015 because there is a requirement for both employers and insurers um, that they report on for employers who had an offer of coverage and then for insurers who actually had coverage. And insurers here includes Medicaid. Those requirements were delayed um, and they were, they were not in place now. So these forms, they're, they're, so the 1095A, remember we said, is what the individual gets about their marketplace coverage. There's a 1095B um, that issuers will use and there's a 1095C that employers will use. I may have it backwards, but you get the picture. Um, at the beginning of 2016, um, in January, those forms are required and, and they will be sent to the IRS and they'll be sent a copy to the individual just like the 1095A. And um, this will mean that the IRS will be doing a, a check on kind of what was on the return against what they have um, from employers and insurers. So I think that, you know, will be the ultimate check this year, probably not as much. And then I think they'll probably be doing a little bit more um, in, in the application process than they've done in the past. So this is one of the reasons I, I mentioned the Medicaid overlap, because, you know, I'm really concerned that if Medicaid is going to start filing forms and say that, you know, somebody had um, Medicaid, and then it turns out the IRS sees they also got premium credits, um, that there will be this, this check and ultimately a request to pay back some of that money. So this is something to be alert for next year. Great. And this is our last question of the day. Um, so um, in some states, um, individuals are uh, told that they need to apply to Medicaid through the Marketplace website. And so once they've been approved for Medicaid, um, do they need to do anything else with the Marketplace website? Or, and also in addition, will the Marketplace reach out to them and let them know that they are improved, approved for Medicaid? Or will the state reach out to them and let them know that they have been approved? No. See, this is the problem. The communication is not great. Um, there, you know, so this is why people have to be really alert. Um, there's some states that are called eligibility states, and there's some states that are called assessment states. Most states are assessment states, but I think you're talking about an eligibility state where the marketplace is actually making a determination of eligibility. In those states, um, it's a little bit easier because, um, although I've heard you know, from some people that even when the marketplace says they're eligible, the state doesn't necessarily um, you know, accept that. But I think in, the, in those cases, you can feel a little more comfortable in saying, and, and there's instructions on how to do this in the document that I link to, um, terminating your coverage. It doesn't happen automatically. And this is what's so worrisome for me, because I would feel, if this was me, that these guys were talking to each other, right? And that, you know, now you've told me I'm eligible for Medicaid, you're stopping my coverage. But they're not. They don't stop it unless you tell them to. Now, assessment states are a little bit different. In those states, um, what the person will get, it will say a notice saying, you know, we think you're eligible for Medicaid. We're sending your case over there, um, and they're going to decide. Now, in that situation, it may take a while. Somebody alluded to the delays, and, and you want to hold on to your coverage then. Or they might say, we don't really think you're eligible, in which case the marketplace, if, if, if the Medicaid agency says you're not eligible, the marketplace has to respect that decision. Um, now, they're saying if you terminated your marketplace, they'll give you a special enrollment period to get back in, but pretty much guaranteed that you've had a gap in coverage in that situation. So that's why it's so tricky. Um, and I think there really needs to be a a better um, process, but that's the process we have stuck, we're stuck with right now. And if there's people on the phone from Pennsylvania, I think this is where, you know, it's really kind of a, a big issue because you have so many people who are moving. Absolutely. Thank you so much.
Um, so thank you again so much to Judy and Amy for all the um, incredible information that you have um, provided us. Um, I do want to say if you um, submitted a question today that we didn't get a chance to get to or if a question pops in your mind in the next couple of days, please um, email us your question and your information and we will absolutely follow up with you as soon as we can. The email address would be hhr at aidschicago.org. Um, and we also, again, encourage everyone to uh, visit hivhealthreform.org. You'll be able to download the slides from today's webinar and also use our Speak Up reporting tool. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you, Judy and Amy, and have a nice afternoon. Thanks, everybody.